Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we need to. I have some stuff going on uh, today, and we need to. I need to get through this uh, fairly quickly. Um, but I have some uh, a couple of things to show you. Uh, happy Independence Day uh, to all the Americans here. Um, if we have any British people here, then I'm very sorry about your lost colony. Um, but you can also celebrate if you want. Uh, okay, so Ultra 0 0.9.6, it's uh, done. It's um, I have not switched it over to the default branch on Steam and on the standalone, uh, but uh, we can do that, I think, at any time. We had some uh, memory uh, issues that uh, had to be sorted out last weekend, um, but I think we've got that all sorted out. I want to thank everybody who was involved with that. Let's see. Um, buffer resize error. Okay, so Klepto2 started the thread, and we had feedback from CGO, C, CJO Games. And I think there was some other people, maybe. Okay. Well, those two guys, at least. Um, thank you very much for uh, identifying that and for being very persistent, you know, that it was indeed an issue. Um, we have very good users. We have very cool users. And I could not do this guy, uh, this thing. I could not do this without you guys. I like that you didn't do a post for 0 0.9.4 or 5. Uh, yeah, you, I just, I didn't really. Is it goes were, to 3 and then, goes, and then just go right to 6. Yeah, it, uh, I think in those cases I was just trying to get like a new stable build up and they were like very intermediate. They didn't have any big features that uh, were very exciting think, to brag about. Um, yeah, because nine point five was our, our switch back to OpenGL. So, so Which, yeah, I mean that was that was like a, a it lot was of a big deal, but not like something you want to like advertise because. Well, it's not that I'm ashamed of it. It's just that uh, it's it's like uh, there are things that are so detailed that only people who are already using the engine like intensely on a day-to-day -day basis know. And right. those people already know everything. I don't need to announce anything to them. It's kind of like the big, uh, the big kind of public friendly features are the things that, um, that I tend to announce. So something like the foliage system, that's a, that's a very big deal that has a very broad, appeal um stuff like and for that reason actually that's why i plan on doing okay so the remaining features before 1.0 are basically decals particles um gpu calling and then some some other details that are pretty uh pretty detailed like you have to already be familiar with the engine to even understand or care about it and for right. that reason i'm gonna do decals and particles first because that has a greater effect on the perception of completeness of the software. Right. Whereas if and I, you'll, and you'll get best screenshots over that with the users. Yeah. So if I just say that. like, Oh, well, you know, Oh nine seven is here and we have GPU calling. Then it's like, it's something that most people don't even know why, you know, what it is or why they would care in the first place. Uh, so okay. I will, I do have the news item. Uh, written up and I'll show this to you guys in advance because you're so special for being here um, Oh this video this is a little tutorial video that this video is an introduction to the foliage system in ultra engine So I'm going to start with this terrain I just have a few simple hills drawn on and this grass texture applied to it I'm going to select the terrain button up here in the toolbar and then over on the right panel uh, select the foliage tool and the first thing I want to do is add our first mesh layer. I'm going to select uh, this grass cluster. And now everywhere that I paint, the grass will appear. 
And I really want this grass to be everywhere, so I'm just gonna press the fill button like that. And now it's everywhere we see. Um, we can increase the visible range of it. View range, there it is, 200. Now this model, uh, it consists of a lot of different clumps of grass combined into one. And so the center of it may be in aligned to the height of the hill, but the edge of the mesh is sticking way out. So we can deal with that. Uh, under the foliage model uh, options, we're going to select per vertex for the alignment. And oh. now the grass clings nicely to the side of the hill. Okay, so then I add in a couple of other layers and let's just look at the trees. One tree appears, but it, each of them has a weight that controls how frequent, and it will create five different selecting at once. We have five different models that I'm selecting at once, and it will create five different sub layers. Each of them has a weight that controls how frequently that particular instance appears. And when I paint the trees on, I'm not just, not just one tree appears, but it's a distribution of many different variations. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, very cool. That came about because, um, I noticed with the vegetation system in Leadworks, uh, oftentimes you had, because the two layers can't see each other, um, you have problems with you know trees growing out of rocks and and stuff and with this approach you can have multiple variations and they're just sort of randomly selected so it's very very easy to lay down um, a forest with a lot of variety it doesn't have to just be variations of a tree you can set up the layers and sub layers anyways any way you want um, and so seeing that finally come out and this is kind of this gif here yeah. is a really nice illustration of it. I like GIFs because it's just like it gets your point across really, really easily in a way that words cannot. Like people see that and they see, oh, different trees are being created. Wow, that's so cool. So this is the news item. It talks about the foliage system because that's the big, big feature. And this is really great because I know, um, uh, what's the survival games are very popular right now. It also talks about the, uh, imposters. You can see it just switched from a 3d model to an imposter. And if you look carefully, you can see it's switching between different views. Of the model. In the imposter system, it can be used with foliage or can be used just on its own. It works the same way either way. Uh, there's some information about the Nature Starter Kit, which is uh, it's up now for the pro version if you have a key for it. Um, and the I have another copy of it for the standard version. And uh, that's waiting for approval by Valve, but that was like two or three days ago, so it'll probably be uh, approved anytime now. And then it talks about some of the animation tools, um, and then the uh, interface for um, installing DLCs, as well as the uh, integration with ambientcg.com. And um, in the future, I plan to add more integrations like this. And then a long list of all the things that we talked about last week. So the 096 build is up and it's ready to switch over to the default branch at any time. The uh, the mailing list art the mailing list uh, email is written and ready to go. This news item is written and ready to go. And I think what I'm going to do is I'll probably put 096 onto the default branch a week before I send out any announcements. And the reason for that is because right now we're in the middle of the Steam Summer Sale. Uh, you can get Ultra Engine and Ultra Engine Pro 
for 20% off right now. And that lasts until Thursday the 11th, I think. But then starting the 14th, it just so happened that the schedule was such that I have a week-long sale then. Well, during the summer sale, everything on Steam is on sale. And so we don't have... Ultra does not have any special visibility. Um, but on during the week-long sales, Ultra does have like disproportionately more visibility than other things on, on Steam that are not on sale. So I think what I'm going to do is release the 096 on the default branch now, and then on Monday the 15th, send out the email and post this news item saying that 096 is actually released. And that way, all the traffic will hit the Steam page at the beginning of the week-long sale, and that will cause... That will cause um, that will cause my page to be elevated. If it's getting more traffic, Steam gives it more traffic. Um, at least I think that's what happens. Yeah, they said they said like they like did a Q and A like how traffic works on Steam, how visibility works on Steam. Pretty much they pretty much they said like in limit terms, if pe if Steam note figures out people want something, they promote it. Yeah. So, and then that seems like a way to maximize uh, the exposure during that week where it's on sale and other stuff is not on sale. So that's the plan. Um, in other news, I got the, uh, I updated, uh, I sent an updated, uh, or another copy I had of that rifle model, the view model to Reap Blue, and reportedly that works fine. Yep, yep, it animates. Um, did you look at the code base or no? I have not, actually. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, because, no, it's okay. I just want your, like, opinions on that, because you said you wanted everything just to be consistent contained one meanwhile i like modularity i like i like lego pieces you know what i mean i like being like okay this is this part does all this stuff for me so i don't have to, don't have to do it. think about it again so well the thing is if you have something like that then you need documentation for it and mm -hmm. it's like okay well maybe it's something we can we can add into the animation system because I don't know. I was I was having like a lot of weird issues like with the animation system. Like it wasn't like I thought it would do something and then it wouldn't do what I wanted to do. Okay. And then yeah, so uh, so I made that and that was like my response. I was just like, you know what? It, the mod's always gonna be playing an animation. It's just gonna blend between multiple animations, and that's pretty much. So it's so it has an idle animation, and then when you want to fire. It blends between the firing and the idle, and then when you're done firing, it blends back into, yeah, it just blends all the animations together. So that was kind of like my response to it. But I tried using like animation stop, like oh, I just want this animation just to play once or or animation once, and then it just kept going forever. So I don't know, if that's a bug. I would have to like really test that and report it properly. Yeah, I mean, the important thing is we had to determine whether the view model we had was, in fact, usable. Because, and it is. Yeah, that's, that's like, like, that's, like, more than 10 times more important than the details, uh, than some fairly simple code details. Right. Uh, because that's a, that's a way, way bigger issue. Because if those models did not work, we would have to go back to the drawing board and find something else. No, but it works. I figured it out. As long as it's a prefab, it's fine. Yeah, that was, I mean, I, that was surprisingly difficult. And everything else, every other aspect of this project is extremely easy compared to just that one, you know, that one issue. Again, you is always a pain. Because they're hard to get right. And just the most difficult models. 
You have to be very high poly. You have to look right in the hand. You know, it all depends on like what the camera fob is. Some can look great in the model editor, but look terrible in game. You have to like compensate for both. It's, it's an art, pretty much. The huh. skin to view model right, is an art. Well, yeah, I mean it's game art, but yeah, even I was like warning you guys like how difficult I expect. I thought that it was going to be very, very difficult, and even I was surprised at like, you know, how it, you know, how many issues we had with it. Um, but that's all good. Um, so I'm not too worried about anything else. Not um, worried about monsters and such. Uh, no, I mean that's, I mean. You just need a you need a some kind of creature with a with a couple of animations, and it's not it's not super important. I mean, we can you know if it's a spider or a zombie or a gorilla, right. they're all pretty much going to act the same. Also, before I forget, you want to explain about the view models and render layers? Yeah, I was about to get to that. Um, okay, yeah. The, I don't the reason- want- the reason I don't like the idea of using different uh, camera, a different camera for the view model, is because um, we're not gonna. I don't think we're going to be using directional lights at all um, in this project. But if you were, each when you create a directional light, it actually creates like a different directional light for every single camera that uses lighting. Um, so if somebody were to take this code and then make an outdoor map. It would render the scene. Um, it, it would store like four textures for the different stages um, uh, of the cascaded shadow map uh, for one direction for the main camera for the directional light for that. But if you did a view model, you would also have to. Um, it would create another directional light. And so with the directional light, you're always rendering like two sections, two extra sections of the scene because you're rendering the area. The area immediately around the camera gets rendered, like the the closest um, cascaded shadow map stage, that always gets Mm -hmm. rendered. Um, And then it it cycles through the other ones and renders one other. So it'll go like zero and one, and then the next frame it'll, it'll render zero and two. And the next frame it'll render zero and three, and then the next frame it'll go back to zero and one, and it just cycles mm-hmm. through them. Um, so, if you have a separate camera, then as soon as you put a view model, you, that view model in with the separate camera, all of a sudden your frame rate is going to drop very disproportionately. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there there's two solutions I came up with. One is to use a very short range for this. Use a second camera, but use a very short range, and right. set the render layers up in such a way that the directional light is not visible to the second camera, and instead have a box light just around the view model that is only visible to the second camera, and just give it a give it a very narrow. Um, area of like you know one meter by one meter and give it a very long length of like you know 500 meters or something like that and that would that would effectively be a directional light that only affects the um the view model that's one way to do it uh but there's another way to do it that i think is even simpler and that's if we have a command that's like set project set projection matrix and that's like a per entity command where you can set a custom projection matrix that overrides the camera's projection matrix for that object oh that sounds useful and that would be that would be specifically meant for use for view models so that you can have a view model with your fov set at you know 50 or whatever you want it to be and then have your your other your FOV for rendering the scene be set at a different right, but where else could this for this function be? Because that seems like I actually like that function. Then instead of like doing like all this like weird things with box lights, kind of just you know, we just have to like think of other uses for that function. So it actually makes more sense. So it's not like just something just for view models, I guess. 
Uh, perhaps it might be used for like 2D stuff because you could supply an orthographic view. Hmm. Yeah, I like that solution better. Um, you probably have to rework the view model code, but because you will know how that works. But yeah, that that will make sense. This way, we don't have to worry about um, the probe reflections or anything. Yeah, it's just simpler, and there's there's fewer mistakes people can make. Right. There's fewer mistakes we can make. Well, yeah, because, like, it's, like, annoying when you have to, like, because you want, it's like, oh, I want my project to have the outline glows. And then you go, oh, and now I want to draw a viewer model. And then, oh, I need the bullet to be on the same layer as the, as the, as the gun, or else the, you'll see the bullet go over the gun or whatever. So it's just. Yeah, it can get complicated. The, uh, the viewports here, um, in Ultra, the, the, uh, This is an old build. I need to do that. Um, the <laughs> viewports, uh, these use four cameras. Right. It uses one camera for the grid. So the grid, I think. Oh yeah, uh, not in in th the 3D viewport, the grid can just be in the same space as everything else, and it doesn't matter because it's using the depth uh, discard to tell what what's on top. Um, in the 2D space, the grid is rendered first in a in its own camera because you want it to be appear behind everything, and then the world is rendered second. And then 2D stuff is rendered on top of that. And I think there's also like whatever is selected gets rendered into a separate uh, camera and then drawn as part of as a sprite on top, like with additive with transparent blending on top of in the final 2D pass. Mm -hmm. Something similar with the 3D perspectives like this, the object has to the selected objects have to be rendered to a separate um camera and it has to be done that way so that they will because early on I decided I wanted it to be like this where the selected objects appear on top of right everything um, so you have to do it that way uh, so it is it can get it's very powerful but it's also it can get uh, pretty confusing when you try to get uh, very complicated. Well, it's it, it gets complicated when you try to modulize everything, when you try to compartmentalize everything, and then you're like, oh well, what happens if this part is here but not this part? You know what I mean? So, the law of leaky abstractions. Yeah. It's like you have to play five steps ahead before you implement anything. Well, yeah, it's but, like when you make things uh, simple, it's. You always have like edge cases that don't fit into that, where that simplicity breaks down. That's what leaky abstractions mean. Mm -hmm. Means, um, maybe in the next update, when you're focusing on that, maybe you can also re revisit how to draw like HUDs and UI because right now, again, we solved that bug with the uh, the post processing when using multiple cameras and one way you would draw like a HUD is to use another camera to draw your sprite elements to it. But that also causes the bug. Yeah, um there's I, I think we're I think we're going to revisit the way that um GUI interfaces are rendered and I, I don't know exactly how it's gonna work yet, but I have some ideas. Uh, so that you don't have to set up a second camera. Yeah, so that'll... It's, it's a it's a, it's a lot of work. You know, like, I think people just want like just to just draw things to the screen like they couldn't light works, where they just say, "Oh, draw a pixel at this location," and not like, "Oh, I got create a camera," and then it got updates position, and then they got to manage when the win if the window resizes, I have to update my canvas size and all that. That's yeah, a it's it's a balancing act because like Leadworks didn't have support for DPI, uh, DPI scaling. You couldn't have done this in Leadworks. 
not very yeah, easily at all. Um, that's that's one of those things that's sort of like it'll get you done. Won't. It'll probably be an 097, but it's not really like a headline feature because people don't know what it is unless they unless they've been it. like gotten down in the weeds already. Another thing right. is um, the uh, a couple of other things I have planned um, that are, again, fairly uh, obscure is um, the per-entity scaling UV uh, and animation um, yes. properties, like a, like a per-entity UV scale, per-entity um, animation of, you know, like sliding uh, and and rotation yeah. of rotation texture coordinates an um, animated plain animation stuff and emission mission colors and all that as well nice. yeah as well as uh possibly uh the same thing in the materials as well as uh, uh detail textures right um which require like several several uh properties um i have some assets that are coming over from unity and they use in um they have a for detail textures they use um they have the x and y axes of a normal map and then they also have a color um like uh offset and then they also have uh an offset for roughness like mm. a way that you can modify roughness but they but nothing for metalness uh so i probably won't even do that um, I'm probably going to change the channel layout because I think I want the X and Y axes to be the X and Y normal map because that's the co most common usage. Um, and then you need like a an intensity factor for each of those channels because you might just have a BC5 normal map that you use for the detail texture, in which case the color and the roughness uh, their effect is going to be is going to be completely disabled because those channels don't even exist in the texture. So you need to have like a, a way to control like how intense that offset uh, is. All right, will that, will this change affect current models or is it just something you do when you're importing them to the engine? Uh, it, it doesn't affect uh, existing models at all because um, since currently we don't officially support detail maps even though there might be some stuff hidden in the shader for that wink wink yeah um so oh, what is a detail map for those at home that don't know because i'm because a lot of things have names but they get renamed when when from engine to engine so is this like a like an overlay like a something you blend with the detail with the color map or it's just a, a texture that um, repeats at a higher frequency than your uh, main texture, and that gives you the appearance of higher resolution texturing. Um, and it's it's typically like pretty subtle. It's like cracks or chips, and it's like it's like a smaller texture, but it repeats more, and it just adds more detail on top of the color, right? Or yeah, exactly. And yeah, that's... that that can be done for um, for the normal. And for the color and for the roughness factor, uh, some of the um, the reason it's, it's really coming up is because um, some of the three D models in that Utah um, Canyon kind of uh, DLC pack that I'm working on um, those those uh, use a lot of detail maps and they do they do make a big difference. Actually, I can probably show you. There's a post some posts on gamedev.net. This is where I go when I need answers to design questions. I'm not even sure how to, let me think for a second. No, 
But maybe I can find the post from here. Yeah. I don't, I don't know the right search terms to find what I'm looking for. So again, everything has a million different names. No, I just I, there was a thread, and I don't remember the words that I used in the thread. There's just some pictures in there that are kind of interesting. Oh, you can't just search for, by your posting history. I I clicked on my profile, and it says you have to be logged in, and I don't think I even have the password stored on this computer. So nice. That's all right. I wasn't planning on showing that this week, anyways. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I think like 096 is ready to put on default uh, at any time. Probably not today. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe Monday, and then it'll actually get it'll go up, and then it'll actually get announced on the fifteenth in order to maximize the effect of that Steam sale that we have planned. Nice. So that's all yeah. I've got for this week. Um, do you guys have any questions? Um, Let's take a look at the chat. I haven't. Uh, um, no, there's nothing in the chat. Just... Yeah, I got a question. Yeah. Um, we would, or something that I can set up the animation speed in the editor would be nice. That a would be animation. nice. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, there is no. Um, you're right. You forgot. Maybe that. I can put that in. This way, this way, you don't have to like do it in code. The thing, the thing with the animation speed, like the animation system, to me, is kind of like very confusing because it looks great in the the model viewer, and then you go to play in game, it's like too fast, and then it's like, or it does. Well, like what I was saying, like you expect something to only play once, and but it loops. Um, so, it's it would be nice to. Ugh, I'm sitting on the floor. Um, my leg is falling asleep. Uh, it would be nice if, to have the. It's always nice to have the speed controlled in the model itself because then you don't have to change the code. Right. When you change the model. Right, but. I think I think you should allow modification to the speed in the code just in case that like those certain situations where oh yeah some... yeah it's it, the way it works is it multiplies the 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 speed factor in, that the code uses which by default is 1.0 by the speed factor that the animation actually uses yeah, but the thing is, is that why does it look right in the in the model in the editor in the preview, but when you put it when you try to like do it in game, it's like faster or something. Mm, I don't know. It should be the exact same speed. Now for the interface, mm. um, everything and all the controls are down here. I'm just I'm a little I'm not sure how to do the interface like if we have a text field here for the speed we're going to need a label next to it that says speed so you know what it is so you would need like a label right here and then a text box here and then all of this would get shifted over that's i'm not the biggest fan of that i'm like i can already see what it would look like and it seems awkward to me we also talked about the possibility of putting like having animations up here and then you select the animation and have the properties appear down here like this and i'm also mm -hmm. not a huge fan of that like e either way i do it it's going to be kind of awkward i feel mm -hmm. I guess that's the reason. That's probably the main reason I haven't uh, haven't already done that. Because you don't know what's gonna like look like to the end user. You work backwards, in a sense. Like you you want to like know what it looks like from the user's perspective before you implement it. Well, I know what it looks like from the user's perspective. I can imagine it very easily, and that's why I'm like, not really. I I can tell it's gonna be awkward if this all gets shifted over here. Like, you know two inches and then it's just that you have just have this label that says speed and then a text box next to it 
and this all gets compressed down. That's very awkward. I also mm. think this, um, these should not be using outline. These should be solid. This should be like a solid triangle. This should be two solid rectangles. This should be a solid square. I don't know why I used lines. But like small, okay. don't use outlines in very small icons is the lesson here, I think. Like up here, it makes sense. But the smaller you get, Once you get to you know something this small, you should just be using solid uh, shapes. Um, and I would actually also like to get some color up in here. I would like these two things to have some color, but I haven't quite gotten it right yet. Um, like I, I attempted to and it looked weird and so I, I pulled back from it. Um, and maybe I'll give it another shot. Mm -hmm. I don't like to do anything until like... Um, until it's really, really right. Um, I think over here we could add, um, like, have a gear icon for options and then a world, like an, an icon of the earth for world properties. And then maybe another for project settings once I add the uh, project settings dialog. And we might even fit cut, copy, and paste in here. Um, but these are the kind of design issues that I, that I think about a lot. Um, yeah, I think also it would be a good idea to put the tracks into the tree view where you write uh, here, here, like animations, and then you can select animation and get some proprietaries below. Yeah, but uh, it, it, it would be nice for also, okay, another thing that uh, that's awkward here is... Um, there's currently no way to change the name. Maybe we could have it so you go up here, tools, rename animation. We could do it that way and have like a little box appear. Like um, edit or edit, edit animation gets to change its name, its speed, and whatnot. I also, uh, I also tried um, making this an editable combo box, and I did not like that because it if you click in this whole area, it just becomes a text editor here and so it's way too easy to you have like if you want to open this up you have you would just have to click on this area in the very right instead of just you know right now you can just click on it and it's very easy um another thing i don't like about the idea of putting the animations listing the animations here is okay let's say you have this tree view here and you have all your animations listed like this well if i select an animation here does this change to match that? Probably, because you don't, because, I mean, if you have, you know, the walk animation selected here, and then this one down here is run, uh, that's a very... Yeah, you can just remove this complete, then the Maybe. Box. Maybe, but I also like, like, I like having this down here also. Um, but do you, then you have no options to edit anything in the small area. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it I think it's it's more reasonable that you have something that people can edit the animations in Ultra. I think this is really important because not everyone knows how to edit animations in, in Blender or something else. Yeah. And yet I really like I really like this because it's just so obvious like like when you open an animated model it's right here and it shows you so easily um, whereas if it's hidden around back here and also like we still need like the play pause stop buttons and this track bar those are global like that's not a property so like where would those be where would this track bar be if so I'm not like I'm not saying like I'm not saying it's a bad idea to put those things in here. I'm just pointing out all the contradictions that I have to resolve before I make a decision on this. Well, you could take the or let the track bar where it is and just remove the selection box and make something like an, an text box where the user can't edit where the selected uh, animation is currently written in. 
Well, well if, a... yeah, but if if you see that, then you're going to naturally wonder like, how do I how do I select another one? What if like you know what if you're like, you have like the root model selected? There's no animation selected up here. How do you know which animation is even is playing? How do you like? There's no like very strong visual indication. So like before like the implementation of the solution is not very difficult i mean it'll take like once i decide what i want to once i answer all these questions it'll take me like an hour to to make it happen it's just the the design has to be worked through first yeah as i said the label instead of the the, the combo box you put a label in there with the name well, if I see um, a label down here, I'm going to expect to be able to like that's where yeah. my finger is going to go if I want yeah, to change the you, animation. You, you could change into the animation tree if someone is clicking on the on the label. Well, that's a that's an interface uh, design that has never that's not very obvious at all. That's not that's something that I've never seen anywhere. Which I, I try to avoid, like, yeah. So it's a real challenge to, I mean, something there's, I'm going to do something, but I just, I don't want to go ahead and implement like a half thought out solution and then have something else that's, that's confusing. It could, you could hide this bar also complete. And whenever an animation is selected in the tree, then the bar is popping up and without the combo box, only with the three buttons like play, pause, stop, the frame selection and the track bar. And okay. whenever no anim or when no animation is selected, you just have no UI at all. But I really think it's uh, it's the best idea is to put the animations into the tree because then you have more space for uh, possible changes. Yeah. Okay. So the the things that we're missing right now are renaming and speed. Are there any other animation properties that I'm missing out, or that we might want to add in the future? I'm not sure what 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 you could add in the feature. There are some, yeah, some other other things as well. But you you, I think these things you can't even do with, with with an interface, whatever on the on the bottom or, or on the sidebar, something like uh, the the speed that the speed is, yeah, aligned with the with the movement from the from the entity. I'm not sure how this is named correctly. I, I was watching a video a few weeks back with with where someone implemented something like this. So the, the animation speed is related to the, the, the walking speed from the from the entity. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um Yeah, I just I need to think through this a bit more and like spend a day just focusing on that. Good ideas, though, you guys. Thank you. Like, this is how we come up with... This is how we come up with, like, the best designs. Also, uh, another point is uh, I, I really need an, an option to break prefabs. Uh, yeah, that's planned. Um, I think I'll wait until, like... I think that'll be in 097 because... Uh, that, because... Um, It'll probably involve some uh, some debugging and stuff. Um, so I think that'll be another one of those like small little things that'll get that'll go into 097. But the the plan for everybody who doesn't know is when you have a when you have a prefab here, um, some of the on some of these groups it just shows like a little lock because the properties are locked um, because it's a prefab. And so the plan is to if you click on that. A little pop-up box will say, do you want to break the prefab? And then it will no longer be a prefab. It'll just be a normal object. And it will no longer be uh, referenced from that original file. Um, that's actually, actually, that's that's very easy to do. 
but I think that'll be like one of the first things I do uh, once 096 goes up on the default branch. This sounds nice because at the moment you need to have the, the model alive in the scene where you create it with if you want to assign, a, for example, a new component. Oh, yeah, yeah. And another thing I was talking with Spider Pig today is mm -hmm. um, if it would be possible to display when, when you have a model in the scene tree, if you um, can collapse it with the bones that you can attach something um, in the editor to bones or to a bone. Oh, yeah. Um... Because right now you can only do it with, with code. And if you would have the option to uh, yeah make it in the editor, it would yeah have really it would be really good. I think we can probably do that. Yeah, I think in Networks was was it was like this even in Networks. Um. Yeah. In in Networks, uh, bones were entities. In Ultra, they are not entities, which um that relieves them from a lot of overhead. That's one of the reasons that it's so fast, but, um, I, th so, uh, if you have an animated model in the scene like this one, mm -hmm. um, there he is. Uh, it does not show the, the bones in the hierarchy because those are a separate system. And it's also, um, It kind of relieves the uh, the tree view from having thousands of extra nodes if the skeleton is not listed. But that was also, like, Ledworks was also using Win32 for the interface. And Ultra is using our own interface, so it's, like, all those nodes are, like, kind of virtual. I, I think that makes it much more scalable. And I think it probably like, if you had a hundred copies of this guy and he's got 200 bones, let's say, or a hundred bones, that extra 10,000 nodes in the tree would probably not be a problem. I think it would probably not be a problem. Mm -hmm. So you're right. If we could show the skeleton here and then if you could just parent objects to the bone somehow um, the way that it works now with models, I think that could probably work. And you are correct that there are, you know, some situations where that would be very useful. I think it would be in any case very useful if you were planning to attach a weapon, for example, you you can attach the weapon, rotate it, and see the weapon how it it, it looks in the editor, direct. So you don't need to run the game five times and make changes with the code. Only that the the weapon got the right rotation for the for the bone where he held hold the the weapon in, or some other item. Yeah, it just it has to be handled a little bit differently because bones are a little bit different of a system. But I think that'll probably I think that'll probably be fine. Good idea. We've got a video here from Alien Head. We can watch this. This is kind of cool. His. It's amazing what you can do with just a good 3D model, some animations, and some sound. That LOD popping needs to be adjusted. Those are pretty close. That sound is like so synced, so synced so well with the motion. I mean, it really looks like it goes together. I think he should improve his camera movement a bit more. 
Yeah, I agree. Dragon has a bit more of Feels like a Game of Thrones episode. Yeah, the camera is a bit jerky and the uh, those LOD distances need to be adjusted, but very, very cool concept. Um, one thing that when you said sound, you reminded me of the uh, idea of, of, of a sound um, library that was accessible. They could just roll that was on the server and you can just preview what you wanted. Yeah, and, what what do you think? No, I really, really want that because it's pain in the butt going through all the... Uh, it's pain about going through like gigabytes of sounds in a zip file. But the issue was you had to talk to Sonus and, and ask if that was like actually like a thing you can actually do legally. You know, I expect, um, I haven't looked into it, but I expect it's probably, I expect, I'm almost certain it's no problem. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, because uh, what were we talking about? Like, um, like you go to the asset library and go to sounds, and then you can like go through all the sounds, and then you can pr and they're on your server, right? And then you could just preview the little clips on the server, um, and then it's like, oh, I really like that sound, and you just download it, go to your project. Yeah, However, so you the, would just you would hover over the over the sound. These right. would just be like an icon or maybe like a waveform. Although that's probably not even very useful because you can't tell anything from looking at the waveform. Um, right. But you hover over it and it plays the sound. It would download like a okay. So to do that, you would need a. Um, or you instead of drawing where the icons, you just put like a little like player or whatever in the middle. I don't know. I would just have like an I would just have like something you hover over so you don't even have to click anything. Right. An issue though is that the um the sounds are all stereo and they may or may not be the one uh, 4100 kilohertz. That's the issue. You have well, to Well, why like, does the why does the frequency matter? Well, I think well, I, I thought it was a limitation of the uh, sound engine. I thought it doesn't like anything. I might be thinking of source, but usually 4100 kilohertz is usually like the norm in games. Uh, I don't think yeah. the I don't think the frequency matters to my to my knowledge. And if we do need to convert anything, I, I'm sure that's a pretty trivial issue. Uh, so for the back end for this, you'd need you need to have like an S a big big S three bucket for this because we're talking like what kind of what kind of sizes were we estimating? I I seem to remember the number like two hundred gigs. It was like something like that. It's it's stupidly big. It's annoying. Like, okay, so let's and uh, I think what are S three prices? The, tran the data transfer I expect for that would be fairly low. Pricing per 100 gigabytes. I think it's like $20 a month per 100 gigs, I think. Uh, storage. No BS guide to understanding S3 storage costs. That's good, because I don't want any BS. <laughs> I think that's kind of overused. It's like... The no can bullshit you, cost to ordering paper plates. Can you not just put it on a, on a server and... Oh, that'll be uh, expensive. That'll be extremely expensive. I have a server for my own. I pay twenty-five dollar uh, euros in a month for it, and I have no traffic limitation or anything else. What it? What's it? It's uh, capacity. It's a uh, five hundred gigabyte. It's a virtual server. Yeah, we might. Uh, I think. I think. 
the ultra server is probably like 200 gigs maybe um i think the numbers we were talking about were probably might be greater than that actually i don't remember like uh, i've also been working with like you know dealing with like geospatial data so i get the two i get all the and also some other stuff and so i get these numbers confused but i'm not sure if we were talking about like a few hundred gigs or if we were talking about like terabytes i guess okay one one thing we could do is that would be very useful is first estimate like how much data do we actually have that would be good to know oh so how big are all the all the saunas uh i i don't know we can uh, i can look there is even a server I'm watching, but it's a German provider. I, I'm not sure if something is existing in 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 on US or something like this. It's for for thirty euros. It's Linux, and you got two four hundred eighty gigabyte SSD RAID one, and it's a dedicated server, not a virtual server. So it's your own machine. Okay, so we've got seven yeah, actually. Six and then seven, eight, nine. We've got nine packs. Uh, and then, probably a yeah, hundred files hard. here. <laughs> I wish you can just hit their servers. So yeah, just even downloading it from directly from their servers is a pain. Yeah, you have to download it. It's like part, more, and you don't you don't know what what sounds they have in it. So and it's like <laughs> you have no uh, traffic limitations, so you don't pay for the traffic. You pay only the thirty euros, and then you have like nine hundred gigabyte storage. Okay, I I think yeah. back actually backblaze is about three times cheaper than S3, I think. But I, I think it's like in terms of cost per terabyte, I th think Backblaze is actually the cheapest. But anyways, it, it doesn't really matter. You have a you have some kind of server. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be a smart server. It's just data. It's just files. Um, you need to have the full resolution version of the file may be stored in mp3 maybe we want to put some comp some compression on that at like 192 hertz kilohertz or whatever you probably also want like a low resolution mp3 that's what the preview is maybe if they're small enough then maybe not um yeah so i guess the first the Biggest question is like, how much data do we have? And then the second question is, what do we want the final format to be? Right. Do we want AUG, MP3? The we can use MP3 now. The the patents well, for that is, have expired. Well, I think I don't think for nine point seven, like we, like we discussed, like the sound uh, implementation needs some work. Um. Because right now, you can't, like, all these sounds, all those sounds are stereo. So if you want, like, like a, just a point sound, you, you have to split the channels and make it mono, which takes additional time. And that's how OpenAL works, from my understanding. In FMOD, it didn't, didn't matter. You just set it as a 3D sound, and the sound engine took care of that. So I didn't have to worry about the kilohertz or what channels the sounds were with FMOD, but with OpenAL, that's now a factor. So, but, like, Andy was mentioned on the forums, he wanted, like, callbacks for a sound, when a sound stops playing or whatnot, and I want uh, the filter system to be global instead of per speaker. Yeah, so that's think, good. That's We'll definitely do that. We'll have, like... We'll have like an argument for like channel for what channel things are playing on, so it'll be it'll be really simple. 
Yeah, so please, please don't remove the speaker. No, 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 no changes. Not like none of the existing functionality will change. No, um, what what I'm saying is that like if you want like a reverb effect, it only it's only per speaker. It's not like globally. So if you want to do like a like an atrium, you have to apply that filter to every speaker in the scene, and that gets annoying. You yeah, just, that's just, that's that's easy to that's easy to change. Um, I also I think I'm gonna use constants for the for the EAX effects instead of like right like. Right. Originally, what I did is I stored mm. all the possible parameters in a JSON file, and those were part of all those JSON files were part of the project templates. Mm -hmm. um, and you would load a sound filter from a JSON file, so you could make your own fo sound filters. But I don't think anybody's actually going to do that. So well, I think maybe maybe modifying like, oh, I want this less echoey, but from really? what I understand, it's very like confusing, and I don't know how it works. Really. So. Maybe you never know. Yeah, I think that's one of those things. It's just like it will never ever be used by anyone. Um, so I think the default, like the stock options, are probably uh, are probably good enough. And if somebody comes on the forum and is like, "Wow, I really need to be able to modify this reverb effect to make it a little bit different," uh, we can deal with that when the time comes. I think. If it ever comes, which it probably never will. Right. But but now you are now my other two concerns are the how the how the, the engine reads the sound the sound data. Because if we want something if we want a system where people can just download sounds and not worry about it, we gotta make sure the uh the sound engine can load those sounds without any any surprises to the end user. Well, I think we big... can we can probably convert all of these to mono, just automatically. I, I'm sure th I'm absolutely certain there's some command line utility or library out there that will, or I can just discard one of the. I, I'm pretty sure I can just discard one of the channels when loading. That's not such a problem. Um, they would well, take less storage, just, huh? Why not just like create uh, is 3D and then for the speaker and then if it's a 3d speaker you just discard the channel when playing the sound so it plays in 3d space instead of uh i don't know so there is no 3d sound yet right there is 3d sound okay yeah then well, i need to figure out how the, the sound is working but this is a different thing the sound the sound file the wave file you're loading it has to be um uh, mono, it can be. If it's stereo, then it can't do the sound spatialization because that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but then then they don't uh, make any sound, right? Uh, at the moment, it is like that. Uh, the I tell the server or every player is telling the server he if they are shooting, and if they are shooting, the other clients yeah spe uh, has a speaker for every entity, and you then they play the sound. Uh, the range of it might be, it might be too far away. Like the range might be too low. No, if I stand left from the entity, it's, it's on, on both speaker, or on both, uh, yeah, on both speakers in the headphone. If I stand right, it's also on both. So you, you hear every time the same sound, not the direction where the sound is coming from. Well, there's a, we have a test case here, fortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see. This, this just plays be. a sound. Let me see if I can find something that does that shows 3D sound. I think I have something in here. What I have right now is uh, I created a component where the speaker gets created at the start, yeah, and uh, I attached this to to the prefab. This was also the reason why I need to break the prefab because I was need to attach this component to it, and uh, then I yeah whenever. Another player is shooting. I I tell this this component, okay, play the sound, and yeah, the speaker is also getting located before playing on the position to the player. Okay, I've got something for you here. The set HRTF um, command, and this stands for head related transfer function. Do you guys know what this is? Yeah, it's yeah. Like I played with it because I mostly wear headphones and and where I activate this or 
This is in the documentation. Head related transfer okay. function means uh, it's a more sophisticated um, way of doing 3D spatialization. It creates a small delay between your right and your left ear uh, because if sound is traveling and it's coming from your right, then it's going to hit your right ear sooner than your left ear. So it creates a, a small delay. I'm not sure if it does anything else. But it does. It does sound better when you're using headphones. It everything sounds a little bit more real. But if you use the, this command here, this this example, um, this does allow you to move the camera around, and so you can see. You should be able to hear sound coming from the right or the left or behind or in front. And this is just from the speaker, or is this a global setting? This is the global. HRTF. Yeah. Uh, um, that doesn't really matter so much for this example. It's just I found an example that uses it where spatialization is very clearly set. So, but it is a global right. setting. Yeah, but the, but the sound has to be a mono sound wave. And you have one the... right here. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just I'm just letting you know, just so yeah. if you want to load your own, like if you have a gun sound but it's stereo. You're gonna hear it like all over. It's gonna be like music or something. Yeah. Which, 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 something you want to argue is like, well, is that acceptable? Because you're right near the gun anyway. But and sometimes I that's what your brain accept it wants. But I don't it's not tell tell that I am on the gun. I I mean the other players that they can hear from which direction the shoot. Right. Is you want you want a minor sound because. Yeah, and the other thing, um, yeah. you probably, Andy, you probably know this, but um, there's the entity listen function. I know this, but okay. this was not working that good okay. when I used this. So, but this this other sound could be working. I need to test it. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we ha fortunately, we have like a. This is basically like a unit test. So if this if this example works correctly for you, then you know it's working. If it doesn't work, then please tell me because that means we have a problem. Um, any plans for sound occlusion? Uh, not uh, eventually, but you know it's not really that big of a priority. Mm. If that could be something, um, at least you can like build it. Since you're not collapsing brushes, you can. Say, oh, if it's a if it's a brush, it's static, it's, and it's gonna like occlude sounds. Yeah, I mean, we can we can do that, but it's not really. I mean, that's like kind of you know tier two or three in my uh, in the priorities. Right. I think right. it's working. I, I, I'm testing it right hey, now. Do we have a roadmap actually about priorities and stuff? Because I have a lot of questions. Uh, about stuff you already mentioned, uh, something we already talked about. Uh, uh, the I can, question I put in the chat and stuff. Do you want to ask your questions, or do you want me to give you a rundown on what my plans are for like 1.0 and a little bit beyond? Um, the latter. So give me a roadmap, please. Oh, the rundown. Yeah, the roadmap. Yeah. Okay. Um. This is uh, Slastroff of the famous Slastroff Horror and Slastroff Horror 2. <laughs> Very yeah. scary. Very cool. Um, okay, so uh, 096, we pretty much know what that's going to be. Uh, 097 is going to be decals, particles, uh, some uh, texture that's animation nice. features, some uh, stuff with the animation system, maybe some sound stuff in there. Um, basically everything that 1.0 needs except GPU culling. Uh, right now, the way our, our culling works is all the culling is done asynchronously on a separate thread uh, that branches off and reconnects uh, with the rendering thread. And that's very cool because that relieves the, um, the entire rendering thread from any overhead. All, like literally all it does is rendering instead of calling and rendering uh, which most engines do but the Jeep I used a uh, compute shader for the foliage system and that worked out that worked so so well 
that once I saw it working like that, then I was like, well, I want to use this for all the culling because this is really, really fantastic. Um, so, but like I explained, like GPU culling is not like a headlining feature because nobody really knows what it is or why it's important. Um, so that's, uh, that's going to be like the very last thing I do in, and then that'll be 1.0, right? Uh, one point after 1.0 is released. Oh, also I, I want to add C sharp programming support and possibly another language. Um, following 1.0, I have two branches of development. One is more like game stuff and I would include, uh, roads, like a road and river and spline tool and, also right. vehicles vehicle physics and that's that i think all of that stuff is more of a 1.1 version 1.1 kind of thing um and there's also another track that i want to pursue that's very very important and that's more of the serious games simulation stuff uh for aerospace and defense and for that uh we're looking at a very big so, like, not just 64-bit floating point numbers, but, like, Earth-scale simulations with real uh, geospatial data feeding in from a server. Um, uh, telemetry, uh, you know, from satellites and ships and other things. Um, in order to make Ultra suitable for... Uh, both for like space simulations and for military applications. Um, because eventually I think uh, my plan has always been for this engine um, has been, I think like eventually I want this to be a tool for uh, uh, businesses for, um, for aerospace and defense. I don't want to lose the consumer side of that um, because I couldn't do it without you guys. I need people to tell me what's good about the engine and what sucks about the engine because um, one thing that you can probably imagine from uh, customers who are working uh, for like major defense contractors, they don't post on the forum. They don't post screenshots of what they're working on, you know? Like, I don't you know, so willing to like upload their projects for you. Yeah. Can debug it. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. In some, in some situations it's like, um, that actually does happen. Um, so yeah, but if it's big as the moon, like, Oh, we have all the moon's data. It'll be like five terabytes of data. Just <laughs> the bug points, the bug, why the car clips to the ground or something stupid. <laughs> well, not just that, but also security. Yeah. Um, so my plan is eventually I think most of the money this company is going to make is by far. I think eventually I think like probably 75% of the revenue of the company will come from aerospace and defense at least. Maybe more like 90%. Um, I don't ever want to get rid of the focus on games because if I do that, that's I'll lose touch with like, I, I, I just, I don't, I'm not going to ever get good feedback from those types of customers. They're just going to complain about like some really obscure feature that they need, but they're not going right. to tell me, I'm not going to get, they're not going to hang out with me on the weekends and do a video call that I upload and, have such great suggestions on right you just gotta remember like you can't just forget about your game developers because they're they're like saying oh well i'm trying to do this or i can do this in this engine why can't i do it in here or whatnot you know yeah what I, mean? So, I mean that's it's that that communication is so important and i'm not going to get that elsewhere and another another factor to consider is that um uh, you guys actually have a huge amount of influence on those types of customers, actually. You guys are the ones who, like, they just... Okay, NASA doesn't have 
some great, amazing game engine. Uh, these big aerospace and defense contractors, they don't have this amazing technology. All the technology comes from the game industry. And the reason for that mostly, I think, is because um, games are a high margin business. And um, defense contractors are a very low margin business, actually. Like when you hear about Halliburton or whoever getting um, uh, getting a hundred million dollar contract for some, you know, to build like some base in Iraq or something, um, you know, notwithstanding the fact that you know Halliburton may have like some issues with corruption, I, I don't know if that's the case or not, but um, mm-hmm. they're not making a hundred million dollars in profit. They're making like. $10 million in profit, maybe probably less than that. And so like just the, the, the prospect of managing a project, a building, some kind of building project where you've got thousands of people involved, that's going to go on for years. Um, and it's going to talk, you know, having to account for every, where every penny is going. Suddenly that becomes, you know, that becomes a lot less appealing when you when you consider that fact, you know, there's sort of like a the restaurant business where, you know, restaurants don't make very much money. They have a lot of money passing through them, but they don't they don't earn very much. Mm. Anyways, my point is that um, low margin businesses don't they don't uh, they're not very good at investing in R and D. Um. Well, R and D is a big time sink. Uh, like I was watching uh, Tim Kaine; he does videos, and he's like, "Yeah, like unless you're Valve or you're someone that, you, no matter what, you just make profit. You don't do any R and D. You just stick with what's safe." Right. But, so they're happy to like when I started getting involved with uh, with NASA, like. Yeah, you know, I was a little bit worried that like, well, I'm from the game industry. Are they going to like look down on me? And it was more like, oh, I'm from the game industry. I'm here to help. And they were like, oh, great. Mm. Um, R&D is difficult because from the outside, you need very, very competent people to do it who are very experienced. And even then, um, you know, things can can go terribly wrong. Uh, I would say probably... mm, I'd say probably well, about a third of the ideas that I tried during the development of Ultra, I'd say about a third of them did not make it into the final product. And that includes right. things like I wasted a lot of time on some voxel related technologies that just I could never the result never was very good and they didn't make it into the end product. Uh, um, you spent all that time on a Vulcan layer. And now we're on the OpenGL. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. It spent a eight ton. Of, spent a ton of time on Vulcan, and that turned out to be a bad idea. Um, I investigated um, a lot of different shadow map filtering techniques, and those all turned out to be a bad idea. Probably some other stuff. Um, so Maybe and. You can- uh, all right, I have to go. Uh, Sorry, that was a ramble. Out. Yeah, thank you for your uh, for your ramble. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? I wrote down. Yeah, so uh, I have a lot of ideas, and I'm actually developing something right now that might be interesting to you. And uh, last question: So the licensing thing, the licensing will stay like this. So if you buy the engine once, then you can distribute your game, your simulation, whatever, without any uh, like Unreal Engine-like licensing or Unity licensing. I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Um, will it cost uh, to use or distribute games within Ultra Engine? He is meaning if the reality free license will stay. So yeah, if, if, yeah, of course. Why? Why wouldn't piece. it? Yeah, because uh, you look at Unity, they tend to up 
from from uh, one day to another they changed it up ultra uh, ultra state like this it's nice and that works also state like this so i trust you in that <laughs> actually and, uh, actually no actually I, um i just changed my mind uh so for every for, <laughs> <laughs> no no yeah okay no i, I think that would yeah, be totally so, uh, counterproductive no never yeah i'm actually working in the field of uh urban digital twins and i want to do some work there but maybe i will get back to you next week with some more details or the week after that uh, and, yeah uh, absolutely i'm that, really that would... happy that yeah yeah, yeah, I'm really happy that uh, Ultra Engine is taking away that. I find very interesting. And uh, it's, it's the biggest, uh, one of the biggest selling points, actually, the license. Which yeah, that's true, but but also the simulation part is super interesting to me. Yeah, but, I, I, but anyway, I, I have to go now. Thank you for your time, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. I will us. watch the stream later. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Okay. But uh, but I think you you said something mm -hmm. like the, the the big terrain streaming and all the stuff, and uh, I think this is this are not the same licenses, right? In the end, the simulation one is is not licensed like the the game engine. Then or? I'm not sure so, yet how I'm gonna do it. Um, I, I'll tell you guys uh, another time. No, l l let me just like gather my thoughts. Okay, like one final. I didn't like. It sounded like he needed to go, so I didn't want to like keep talking. I wanted to let him finish whatever he wanted to say. But um, the, the like the last point I wanted to make about um, R and D is that um, even if you know what you're doing, like from the outside looking in, um, good R and D and bad g good R and D is indistinguishable from engineers just fiddling their thumbs and and wasting time twiddling their thumbs like you cannot tell it's very very hard to gauge progress with R&D it's really really hard even when you're the one doing it and you know what you're doing um it's really difficult so like for a manager can I, can I ask something yeah uh, because i think it's super interesting what you are uh, telling but what is R&D Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, research and development. Okay. Yeah. It's just a well, fancy, was, fancy term. I was gonna for... say you'll be you'll be like looking into something. Like what I do is just R and D. What I like to do is I get like a nice small game idea, and then I just hammer out all the details. I like I, I miss games when they were just like very simple and everything and all the game pl play elements like were inter complemented each other. And those are the games I kind of like to do, and my experience of doing and my think whole thing is just research and development. But what happens is that you'll get an idea, and then you'll be playing or playing with it, and then all of a sudden you'll be like, "Oh, I can do this now," or "Oh, what happens if this um goes?" or "What happens if I like?" or you find a a bug and you make it into a feature, like the um the wall bouncing in Cyclone. That was a bug, and I thought it was fun, and I made it into a feature. So, yeah. It's like, 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 Blizzard, this is not a bug. This is a feature. Well, no, it's just like it, because, um, you don't know what you want until you play around with it, and then you, and the more you play with it, the more ideas you get, or you might run into an issue, and then you have to think of a solution to that issue, and then which opens another can of worms or another door. So, it's a very ongoing thing. And when you go to production, you just want you just want to know what you're doing and just do it. You don't want to have to answer any solving problems. That's R and D's job. So, like, how is this gameplay element gonna interact with this gameplay element? How is gonna complement it? You know, how is something not gonna be overpowered? When you're developing, you just want to implement the system the best way possible and move on but yeah that's been my experience
Um, mm. Yeah. So my uh, my uh, ongoing plan is to uh, have an enterprise version of this with. I'm not sure how the features are going to be split up or if they're going to be split up at all. Um, maybe the only difference will be the license. No matter what, I know that I'm going to need people close to me who are using the the whatever features the Enterprise version has actively uh, because otherwise I'll never be able to deliver a good product. Um, the That Enterprise product uh, will be sold to businesses on a subscription, on an annual subscription. Um, I don't know the exact pricing, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like $1,000 a year per seat. Um, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I don't expect you guys to pay for, pay, you know, uh, $1,000 a year. So don't, don't worry about that. Um, and you'll also notice uh, in our licensing agreement, let's see for this. It's same as Lightworks, but there's a price limit. There's a in there's revenue no price limit. limit. There's a seats limit. I think there there might. I think there That's, is a revenue limit, but what's what's yeah, really limit. important? Oh, okay, I did it by employees, by number of employees. That was smart. Yeah. Yeah, because every oh, the reason oh, I did yeah. that is because it, it every, was. There was a revenue. There was a revenue limit, and then you're like, "Well, that will just turn people off." And it's like, "Okay, well, if you're just a small team, you you get it. You don't have to worry about it." Well, I the thing is, indie indie, develop, indie developers don't want to work with the team. They just they all want to do. They all want to write something all by themselves and be, and make like a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. And so they don't they don't usually think about like growing a company. They just think about money. So this okay. is effective. This is saying the exact same thing. This is saying the exact same thing as a million dollars in revenue, because if you have a million dollars in revenue, you're going to have ten full time employees if you're responsible. Something you know, roughly something like that. Um, but this puts it in terms that is more agreeable. But the the important fact fact here is. Furthermore, it does not authorize usage by governmental or military agencies, which that's a little bit redundant because if you're military, you are government, but or any individuals, contractors or subcontractors acting on their behalf. It cannot. So it can't be used for uh, the kind of projects that um, um, that NASA, the military, yeah, the defense contractors or whatever are working on. Um now, if there is somebody out there who does want to use it, um, you know that's certainly an, an option, but that needs to be uh, negotiated se separately. Um, I think maybe I'm I'm not sure. Um, uh, you you maybe could, for example, make a special version from the engine also, which you deliver the source code with, and that I, I, for example, big studios they 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 want to change things often in in engines and uh, then they can make the changes and you you can say okay you can change it for your own but uh, yeah don't make don't give the the project away or something uh yeah absolutely i mean i'm willing to i've done i did a few source code licenses for leadworks um but that's something that's like rare enough it doesn't have to be i mean if, if somebody needs that they'll just contact me mm -hmm. Um, so what what this the way this has, I've done this in the past um, is um, ultra is quite new and any projects that use it I want to make sure that they're successful and so what I typically do is I'll I don't charge very much for the engine but I will but one of the conditions of using it it doesn't have to be but this is like one thing I've done in the past is that one of the conditions of using this this software, if it's what you need, is um, I, I, I like to be part of the project. So in that case, you know, they're, they're paying me more for um, more for my labor, but I get to work on these uh, these different projects using my technology. Um, and that has worked out very well, because if we do run into a problem, then 
I can, I'm able to identify that and fix it for them or make whatever improvements need are needed. And they don't get charged for, you know, if I'm doing something to the engine, they don't get charged for that. They only get charged for the time I spend on the project. Um, the company that has come closest to what I'm describing is, is actually Unigen. I believe they do a lot of uh, defense contracting. Of course, they're, they're a Russian company. Um, which is, well, they were at least, um, which is a bit awkward right now. Um, I, I think they moved their offices to Europe somewhere, but they're still, I mean, the fact, I mean, if you're working with American, uh, companies, like they greatly, they won't even work with, uh, some European countries, like everything outside of America is suspect. Oh yeah, this is true. <laughs> I, my, I, I have an older brother and they moved the company from Europe to America because they have many American clients and yeah, it's a bit more easier. And was they, it, they will, was they the company in Germany? Uh, I'm not sure if I, if I can tell the name in, in the internet. Well, you don't have to tell me the name, but was it, was it in Germany? Uh, they, no and yes so they have an office yes. in germany and an office in uh, i think it was paris do you know where their main office was in frankfurt yeah yeah uh germany is one of those countries that i was talking about and uh yeah what they do basically is they they buy insolvent or yeah companies which have no money anymore and then they yeah, restorate this this uh, this this companies and sell them. Hmm. So, something like investment stuff and yeah, like flipping a house. Yeah, for example, you you buy a house, an old house, make it new and sell it. Huh. That would actually that would actually be a pretty interesting uh, thing to be into. Um, let's take a look at what's last off wrote because i haven't read this yet i would like to implement a procedural foliage generation system in ultra specifically generate a map what foliage spawns based on landscape height map texture maps you can probably do all of that with the foliage system i actually um i forgot to mention this i just wrote up the documentation it's almost complete graphics mesh layer You've at least got like the syntax um, for all of these written out. Mm. Procedural generation is found in Unreal Engine. Is there anything like that planned? Great tool. At the same time, new updates to Vegas. Actually, start program because the entire code cannot work in the next update. Thank you. Uh, so, Slastroth, if you do see this video, uh, take a look at the documentation for the mesh layer system because that's got everything now, and that would probably fit really well with whatever procedural ideas you have. I think I have said everything and anything that I wanted yeah, to say you, today. Didn't you, have, didn't you have other things going on? I, it's like, oh, I don't want to be on so long, and now it's two hours later. So hopefully you didn't miss whatever you had to like, do. <sighs> I don't hear any people coming in, but I should. I guess, yeah, I guess I should probably wrap this up. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, the way, the direction our conversations take always surprise me. Again, you're you're in a spot where you can have these conversations. You're not. It's not like a million people join and they all want to say something to get your attention. It's just right now. It's just a nice small chat. So you can. You're in a spot. You can do this. Yeah, a few years from now, and I think like maybe not even that long. I think we're gonna look at this as like the good old days. Well, in hopefully some we ways. can. Hopefully we can. Hopefully you can run something for your loyal customers. Yeah. People. I'm just saying like, as you grow, like things kind of change, um, with all companies in Europe. Uh, there's, 
Elua. I, I think I think he means uh, Ultra or Lua. Um, there's there's no restrictions. There's I don't attempt to put any restrictions on um, where the software works. Um, we Steam is compatible. I think do they still sell? They sell to China. Um, actually, they have like this is kind of weird. I found uh, I think it's Steam China. Let's see. Um. I think Steam actually has like a separate version of Steam. I don't remember the URL, but I posted it last week yeah. in Discord. Um, I just I just follow I just follow the law. I don't. Um, oh, I, I know, yeah. like like PayPal, like cut off uh, service to uh, some companies recently, or to some con- different countries, and. I don't do anything unless it's le- unless it's unless I need to. If there are officially sanctions, like there are, like we officially have sanctions against Iran, for example. Um, there's even if I wanted to, like there's no way for me to sell software to Iranian people, um, and I so I just follow the law. I don't make up my own laws, so. Any other questions? You know, um, one thing we do have to work on is fixing the undo bun- bugs, but that's, that's again. Oh, yeah. One, one other thing I was posting today and, and bug, but it was actually not a bug. It was not just clear um, that I have to, yeah, make certain things in order to move an entity around and then use the input system again. Um, I think Reap was, was giving the, the right answer. So I, I need to turn off the, the physics, then I can move the entity, then I need to sync it and then I need to enable the physics again. And this is mm. working and maybe something like a web function, which is doing this for you would be good. Like yeah, yeah. I ran into that issue with my project because my project involves teleportation, and I was running into that. And I, I was like, and usually, when I had issues, physics issues in Webworks, I would just disable it, do what I had to do, and just re-enable the physics. And well, was are we talking player physics or are we talking rigid body physics? Uh, player physics. Okay, those are two separate systems. Um, I was kind of I, I looked at it and I was that was like one thing that I was suspecting where mm-hmm. the problem might be. So uh, thank you very much for for like yeah, that gives me more information to go on. So now I know exactly where to look. Yeah, yeah. thank you very I much. I thought yeah, because I because because there's the sync connect command now, and I was like, well, I probably should if I'm just directly just teleporting something, I probably should use that. But then which works with the with like rigid bodies, but not the player physics. But just resetting just like jump starting the physics um the physics type type solve the issue. If you manually set change the orient the position of an object, then I think the player should just automatically detect and account for that automatically i don't think it should take any other special work so let me take a let me take a look if it's not working that way then it's then it's a problem so let me now that i know where to look i can i can fix that yeah i have also an example for you you just need to um replace the course from the first person controls with the code i posted and press enter then you see what's happening yeah 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 yeah, i saw that thank you very much because at the moment I'm working on the on the deathmatch server, and uh, of course when a player is dying at some points he needs to respawn again, and it's kind of strange if if you if you let them respawn and then they press W and then they are in a complete different position again. Well, he has so, to re yeah. he has to reincarnate first, so his soul has to like travel across the distance <laughs> before he comes alive again. <laughs> um yeah uh cool thank you very much uh yeah you guys are very very cool and awesome because there's really no way i could uh i could do this without all of your wonderful feedback Mm -hmm. all right so with that uh we'll conclude uh the video for this week 
Mm-hmm.